Well, church, let's pray and hear from the Lord. Father, we love you, and we praise you, and we thank you that we have a chance to hear from you and not from a man. So, Father, I'm going to decrease and allow your spirit to rise bold in me to teach and to preach what's on your heart and what's on your mind. And I pray, Father, we will listen with a mind to obey, to receive, and grow thereby. We love you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus Christ's name. We do pray your thanks. Amen. With our Bibles turned to Philippians chapter 4, I want to remind us of our worldwide theme, which is church, a mind to work. A mind to work. And church, God has given us a good work to do. And it's good because the work was ordained by God, it benefits others, and it has lasting value, church. And I said early on in the year that success with God requires a work ethic. Success with God requires a work ethic. In church, we have to maximize this season of time to work. There'll come a time when we won't be able to work, so we have to maximize the season that we're in right now. In church, we have to have a mindset change or a change of our mindset as it relates to work. Because how we feel about work determines how we work. How we feel about work determines how we work. And I said, church, when we, we began this mega series that we're in right now, to have a mind to work, we must be one with the vision, the plan, and the motivation of our worldwide ministry. And church, when I say to be one with, we must believe in, agree with, and increase in knowledge of our vision, our plan, and the motivation of From the Heart Church Ministries Worldwide. See, church, our vision, our plan, and the motivation, they work. And we have to have, in order to have a mind to work, we must believe and have confidence that they work. Listen to this statement. I forgot to give it to you when we were in the vision teaching but I want to make sure that you have this because it's so important. The vision, the plan, and the motivation are extracted from, based on, and subject to the Word of God. The vision, the plan, and the motivation are extracted from the Word of God, are based on the Word of God, and they're subject to the Word of God. In our previous division, church, we looked at the vision works. The vision works. And I said, church, the vision of our worldwide ministry is our original instructions from God the Father. See, God the Father gave the Father of our worldwide ministry instructions for our church. Also said, church, the vision of our church is our character. Character is how we're regarded. And I was thinking about this the other day. And I, I haven't said it in a while. If five people independent of you say the same thing about you, it's true. That's your character. That's how you're regarded. If five people who don't know each other Say the same thing about you or me, good or bad, it's true. And also said, church, the vision of our church is that from the heart church ministries worldwide was patterned after the church of Philippi. And that church is to love God, hate sin, and love to give. That was a quick review for the folks who might not have heard all the messages previous. You can go to our YouTube channel and get caught up very quickly. So I want you to subtitle this division, The Plan Works. The Plan Works. For you copious note takers, this is Division 2, Part 1. 
Y'all love to correct me about what part and division this is. So this is division two, part one of the plan works. And with great church, the intent, purpose, and objective of the plan works gives us greater insight to what the plan is. Listen to the intent of the plan works. To accomplish the vision. That's the plan, to accomplish the vision. Listen to this way, church. A vision without a plan is just a dream. A vision without a plan is just a dream. Listen to this more expansive definition as relates to the plan. The plan is a systematic approach to accomplishing the vision. Our vision of loving God, hating sin, and loving to give. The plan is a systematic approach to accomplishing the vision. And our foundational scripture for this particular division will be found in Philippians chapter 4. We were just there on Wednesday. Already have you turned in Philippians. Let's start reading in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Word of God says here, finally, brethren, sisterin, children, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, church, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The operative verse is verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, what does it say? Hmm. Do. And the God of peace shall be with you. This is dawning me right here. If you've learned something, received something, heard something, and seen something, and the person who's been delivering it to you, and you don't do it, you won't have the peace of God. We are a doing ministry. As you can see by all the things we have on our calendar of events, we are a doing ministry. So we can't have a vision of loving God, hating sin, and love to give, and not know how to do those things. And the plan is what helps us to do the things that I just mentioned. So that'll be our foundational scripture for the next couple of weeks. Listen to the purpose of the plan works. To conduct ourselves with the right purpose of heart. To conduct ourselves with the right purpose of heart. Listen to this substatement or a couple of substatements underneath that purpose. Our conduct is a manifestation of our heart. Our conduct is a manifestation of our heart. Which ever in our heart translate to our mouth and to our feet. See, after a while, our heart will tell on us. See, church, we must be right, clean, and holy in the core of our being, in our heart. We must be right. We must be clean. And we must be holy in the core of our being, which is our heart. I'll say it again for the folks in the back. We must be right. We must be clean. And we must be holy in the core of our being. Where, church? In our heart. When you finish writing all of that, make your way over to Matthew chapter 15. And we're going to see what's in our heart. And some of us will be surprised of what's there. As you make your way to Matthew 15, the Pharisees 
approach Jesus with a problem. It wasn't, it wasn't Jesus' problem. It was their problem. And they were upset at the disciples because they were eating bread and not having washed their hands. And, you know, the Pharisees, were, you know, they were the interpreters of the law. So they were quick to go back to say what Moses said in the Mosaic Law, which is the first five books of the Bible. And they said, well, you should not eat bread with unwashing hands. And Jesus chastised them for what they were saying. And we want to pick up reading in verse 10 of chapter 15 of the book of Matthew. And the word of God reads as follows. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth to follow a man, but that which cometh out of the man, this to follow a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the um, Pharisees were offended? They always offended anytime Jesus had anything to say. After they had heard the saying, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Mm. Let them alone. I love that. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into a ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. In other words, Jesus, what you just said, we don't understand. And Jesus said unto him, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in that, and that and at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast into the draught? We know what a draught is, right? Okay, I didn't have to explain that. Verse 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. What Jesus was saying here is, first of all, wash your hands before you eat. That's not an excuse for us to be nasty now. Don't, yeah, don't do that. What Jesus was saying Stop worrying about what's coming in. Worry about what's going to come out. Because in our heart are evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. All those things are in our heart. So now it makes sense what Solomon said over in Proverbs 4.23, that we have to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We don't have to guard what's going to come in. We have to guard what's going to come out. So how do you guard what's in there from coming out, and how do we actually clean up what's in there? Go with me over to Ephesians chapter 4. And for those of us saying, none of those things in my heart, what well, lying is. See, Mother, I pray for us to have a lot of children in the church. We have a lot of children in the church. So I have to change how I say things now from the pulpit. It used to be when I first got here, I could just say something, but now I've got to be careful. Because some of us think that we're not fornicating or we're not committing adultery, but we are. You know, virtual fornication and adultery it's fornication and adultery. Just because you're using IG, Twitter, which is now X, which, by the way, here's what's in the heart of a man. You go from Twitter to X. Why go from Twitter to X? Guess what was just announced this past week? They're now going to make available X-rated material on X. Where before, there were disclaimers and um, gatekeepers that prevented that material, or filters that prevent that, informa um, that information to be there. Now it's going to be readily available on X. 
Now you can have X-rated material on X. There was nothing wrong with Twitter. First of all, I, mm, stay, stay focused, Mike. There's nothing wrong with the name of Twitter. So why change it to X unless you want to make it X-rated? But if I had however many children by multiple wives, I'm living an X-rated life, so I might as well call my platform who I am. But yet and still, we can't help ourselves from being on these platforms. Anyway, here's how you rid yourself of those things that are in your heart, in my heart. We're in Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 17. The word of God reads as follows. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not or behave not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind or heart, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Jesus was, talk was just talking about being blind over in Matthew chapter uh, 15. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness <laughs> to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. Learn, seen, received, okay, and do. My mother used to say it this way, study long, study wrong. After a while, you got to apply what you study. Verse 21, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Here's what you have to do, that ye put off concerning the former conversation or conduct or behavior, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind or heart and the core of your being. Look at verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which is after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, the problem a lot of us Christians are having out here in these streets is we're taking the new man and putting over the old man. That's like not showering for a week and then putting on new clothes. It's going to still stink. What you have to do is shower. No, first of all, take off the old clothes. Shower, then put on the new clothes, which is in Christ Jesus. And here's the other thing. Don't take off the new man. See, we're not superheroes like Spider-Man who takes off his uniform at night. We keep ours on. And too many of us are taking off. See, we put on the new man when we come to church. We put on the new man when we come to Family Fun Day. But then when we go to a place where we ought not to go, we take it off. But you're going to smell like where you've been. See, when I used to drink drinks that weren't soft, my wife could say, when I came home, I can smell those drinks or that alcohol through your pores. I, think, I can't smell it because you can't smell your own stink. Like, you're the last person to know that you have bad breath. So this is a constant work that we have to do. See, coming to church like I used to back in the day, every first Sunday, Mother's Day and Easter, wasn't going to keep me clean. Think about this. If you only showered every first Sunday, Mother's Day, and Easter, you would not be what we would consider to be clean. We have to clean ourselves every single day. And I see this movement online where people are talking about how if, you know, you know showering every day dries out your skin, that's why God made lotion and Vaseline. I don't care. If you got eczema, they got all kinds of creams and ointments for you. Shower every day. We, we, we believe anything. We, we, anyway, 
Stay focused, Mike. Stay focused. Our objective, we're just to the objective. No points today, by the way. No points at all. Our objective is to teach and remind us to preach the word. That's one thing, just to preach the word, because there are those of us who think that only people in a robe standing behind a pulpit preach. All of us preach. There was a whole lot of preaching going on yesterday and on Friday. A ton of preaching. It might have come in the form of playing a silly game or having a great seafood sandwich or that ginger ale bowl. Ooh, that was real good. Ooh, that was good. I felt it right in here, my spirit. But all that was preaching. How about this church? Another part of that objective is to teach and remind us to build the infrastructure. I can't wait to get to build the infrastructure. And Brother Cephas, who I love, sent me a note last night. And he said something that really I had to think about, Brother Cephas. He said, Pastor, did you recognize that we had the founding mother of the worldwide ministry here, the founding mother of our local church, and our very our current first lady here? That's infrastructure. Our church was established in 1981, 1981, the worldwide ministry. And here we are now, some 43, 42 years later, the founding mother, the founding mother of this local church, and the current first lady are there. Let's go a little bit further. The founding mother of the worldwide ministry's great-grandchildren were here. The, grand, the son and grandson of the current, of the founding mother were here. And the son of the current first lady was here. All of which have a call to preach God's word. Biblical infrastructure. That's what I saw through what Cephas reminded me of yesterday. That's infrastructure. See, yeah, don't get confused about the games and all that. See, a lot of you all only want to come to church on Sunday. <clears throat> I can't even say Wednesday. But only want to come on Wednesdays and Sundays. The church is alive seven days a week. So we have to teach and remind us to preach the word, to build the infrastructure, and how about this last one, church? To reform the church. That's actually the plan of our church. To preach the gospel. To build the infrastructure. And to reform the church. And I want to make sure I say this. Back in 2018, our constitution was amended to change preach the word to preach the gospel to be more specific about what we were saying. Because there's a lot of word out here. And some of the word isn't uh, grammatically correct. How about that? But what we need is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the goal, church. To glorify the Father. See, once we accomplish the vision, which is the plan, the goal here is to glorify the Father. You don't have to turn there, but listen to what Jesus said towards the end of his earthly ministry as it relates to glorifying the Father. John chapter 17, I'm starting reading in verse number 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I love what Jesus says here. I have glorified thee, 
on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I, have, which I had with thee before the world was. Church, if Jesus is our example and he glorified the Father, guess what? We can too. Here are seven statements that will be the foundation to this division, if you will, regarding the vision or the plan works. Here's the first statement, church. The times will change, but the plan must remain the same. Our local church has now been in existence for 22 years. I promise you, the times have changed. But the reason why this church is still here, because the plan has remained the same. See, church, how we accomplish the plan may change. But the plan must remain the same. You know, on New Year's Eve, we've had plays. We've had family game night. We've had praise. All those are great. Those are different ways to preach the gospel, to build the infrastructure, to reform the church, right? But we haven't changed the plan. We might be doing things differently, but the plan remains the same. Here's your second statement, church. The plan is always carried out by the committed members of the church. The plan is always carried out by the committed members of the church. See, the committed members of the church carry out the plan, but the plan benefits more than just the committed. And just to give proper respect and sourcing to this message, Bishop Cherry taught a message, oh goodness now, let me get my math wrong, eight years ago called Committed to the Plan. And God had me listen to that as I prepared for this teaching. I want to make sure I gave him credit for a lot of what is being offered today. The committed members of the church carry out the plan, but the plan benefits more than just the committed. See, the committed members tithe. But those who don't tithe still benefit from the committed members tithing. And the people who tithe don't complain about the folks who don't tithe. They're just doing what God told them to do, which just happens to be being a blessing to other people. That's how you know you're committed. Here's the question we have to ask ourselves. Am I a committed member? And I taught that message on July 21st of this year. And God said, there's going to be a part two to that. So stay tuned for part two of Am I a Committed Member? And here's something for us folks who've been in the church a long time, whether this church locally or the worldwide ministry. Don't confuse well-tenured with being committed. Because... And let me get my math right. In a couple of weeks, I would have been in this worldwide ministry now for 30 years. That's a long time. Praise the Lord. That's great. But my 30-year tenure doesn't necessarily translate to me being committed. Because there's somebody who's brand new in this church who's more committed than someone who's been here 10 years. Yeah, so don't let your number be your bragging rights. Mm -mm. Matter of fact, <laughs> you can see those commercials, they say, we've been in business for 75 years, but you could be doing bad business for 75 years. I always tell clients, don't put that in your commercials. No one cares. No one cares how long you've been at this ministry or this church. Are you committed? Third statement. 
Nothing can be truly successful without a plan and a commitment to it. Nothing can be truly successful without a plan and a commitment to it. Church, we must trust the plan of preaching the word, building an infrastructure, and reforming the church. That's our plan for our church. If you notice, we keep a tight box of what we do. I'm not saying what, we, what someone else does in another church is right or wrong. God's called us to do it this way. It's not better or worse. It's just what God's called us to do. Well, Pastor, why don't you have one of your so-called friends who you know out in gospel world to come um, sing a song here? It doesn't fit into our plan. Is it wrong? No. Can I call so-and-so or so-and-so? Yeah. But that's not what we do with our church. We're not known for being a concert-driven church. There's some churches that are. There was a church that was known for its plays. I mean, live animals, everything. I mean, they would advertise as far as New York and down to the Carolinas. Churches would have buses come in for weeks. Now that church is closed. Probably the largest church in the area, square footage-wise. I mean, beautiful. A little ostentatious in my taste, but beautiful. Closed. Because they were focused on plays. And now, one of the elders from that church is now has his own church thriving because he's focused on preaching the word. I will call his name, but I just saw him the other day, so I'm going to be quiet. I won't give him too much credit. So when you say, man, why don't we have the biggest and baddest choir? Oh, there was a choir up on R Street, Northwest, for years. If I call the name of the church, boy, I mean, y'all would know the church. Yeah, mother, you know the church. We've been around for a long time. Bad choir. Oh, man, people came out of that church and that choir. Then they decided to move over to Maryland. And the foundation of that church sat for years. And now that church could probably fit into the cubby hole of this um, pulpit. One of the biggest, most impactful churches. We sing some of the songs from that church today. They were focused on choir. We focus on preaching the word. Now, nothing's wrong, because we have plays here, don't we? But we don't make that the whole focus. Now, how about this? The plays we have here are focused on the word. The fitted sheet contest we played yesterday came out of the statement that I made. How we feel about the work determines how we work. Because I said I can't stand folding fitted sheets and it looks like it when I'm finished because I don't like doing it. That wasn't a game. That was a lesson from God's word. Trust the plan. Well, that's a little boring. Huh. Preaching the word might not be boring, but in 20 years when your grandchildren are adults, it'll still be here. Number four. The plan for the worldwide ministry in our local church makes us the substance of our faith. The plan of preaching the word, building infrastructure, and reforming the church, it makes us substance of our faith. And our faith is the confidence we have in the testimony of God. I can say it this way. That plan makes us the substance of Jesus. Here's your fifth statement, church. The plan allows us to be excellent. Sister Brown, Sister Brown had to enunciate that. We had a good time in fellowship yesterday. See, just fellowshipping with each other, you realize how close we are to one another. 
It isn't by accident that we're here together. God chose us to come to this church at this particular time to network ourselves together. My brother who's visiting for the first time, it isn't by accident that you happen to be here. You know how many years God's been working with the Daniels family to get you here, to be here, so that you can hear this word today? But the plan allows us to be excellent. See, the hallmark of our ministry is excellence in ministry. Literally, <laughs> that's the hallmark of our ministry, to be excellent in ministry. Here's your sixth statement. Church, the plan keeps us through and in the midst of change. The plan, it keeps us through and in the midst of change. Mother, I was up early this morning thinking about the church when I got to this statement. Our church, our local church, has been in existence for 22 years, right? This is our fifth location. Hotel, White Plains, Iron Gate, Annex, and here. And this will not be our last location. I need y'all, I need, I need, and as such we pray, I need y'all praying harder. We're facing some opposition. Wait till members meeting. With all those changes, the plan remained the same. When we had to move into the annex at 5055 at the parent church, which was a little back room, maybe the size of this part of the sanctuary, the plan didn't change. And guess who helped you move (laughs) before I was your pastor? Guess who helped move the chairs that you're sitting in right now? My son. A couple of months before I was assigned to be here, didn't even know I was going to be assigned here. And all that change, the plan has remained the same. Because listen to this, church. Change causes the potential for division. Because what happens is when you change something, oh, I don't like that. Mm. Why we gotta, why we gotta change choir robes? I like the ones we have. Well, you know, I've been thinking about leaving the, the, the choir anyway. Don't you want to leave with me? If you want to leave the choir or this church, leave by yourself. Always gotta pull somebody with us. But church, change causes the potential for division. Whenever there's a change, there's a potential for division. Every time. Every single time. But here's the thing we have to be careful of. When we do not have a plan, change becomes our life. This might sting for some of my young people. Why do you keep changing your cell phone number? Because you're not steady on a plan for your life. There's one brother who I've been ministering to for years now. I love him. I love him dearly. Every time he calls me, he calls me from a different number. He goes, Mr. White, I, uh, I have to change my number again. Bruh, why you change your number? And here's the reason why, man. Because you didn't got caught up with some gal who you, mm, children are here, Michael, who you, you were in, you got engaged with, not married, but you were engaged with, and you were tiring, tired of being engaged with her, and she was becoming a little too engaging, and you had to find a way to disengage, so you change your number. Now, I get it. Sometimes you move, but my Lord Jesus, if you change your number, I'll go, let's see, since the pandemic. If your number's changed two and three times, that's a problem. Who are you running from? I I don't even know. I think I've had this same number on my cell phone since I had a cell phone. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know to who who to call. I know I can call Verizon to get it changed, 
but I wouldn't even think about changing. Why am I going to change it? I can barely remember it now. When you go somewhere, they ask you, what's the last four digits of your number? I was like this. Six, three, four, eight. Y'all change your numbers like you're changing your underwear. Which has to be changed every day, by the way. <laughs> Apostle, I heard you. I got good ears. But see, when you don't have a plan, change, change becomes your life. And too many of us, we can't keep a job. One minute, you want to be an entrepreneur. Next minute, you want to submit your resume to the government. Next minute, you want to be an HVAC. Next minute, you're going to go to the trade school. Next minute, you're going back to college. Next minute, I don't care what you, well, that's not true, Michael. I do care what you do for a living. But whatever you do, stick with it for a while, especially when it gets difficult. That builds some character. Can I go, I used to be a boss, so I can go ahead and say this. I'm still a boss, but, um, you know, the young folks get that. See, I, I like the young people in the church. I get, I get my little dumb jokes. Um, I used to be a manager. Let me say it this way. Managers get on your nerves all of the time. You can't leave a job every time a manager gets on your nerves because you'll never keep a job. Whether you were in the school system, fire department, government, see, I, oh, I love teasing Minister Webb because he's has his own business. He's, he's thriving, doing well, because people go, I'm tired of having this one boss. I'm going to be my own boss. That's not how being in business works. You have more bosses when you're an entrepreneur. And see, now those bosses are actually paying your bills. So you think that that one boss gets on your nerves at the job? Clients, see, he's too holy. I can say it. Clients, you think bosses get on your nerves? Clients will drive you crazy. They will drive you bald and gray. I spent 33 years in a business where I had clients. Lord, have mercy on my soul. They still call me to this day asking me questions. I won't, I can't say, because this person is running for Senate, so I can't say who this person is who called me. And her office called, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Say, Mike, I know that you no longer ask so-and-so, but can, I, can we get your help? Absolutely you can. I happen to like you, client. Wink, wink. So in case you need me, wink, wink, I'm here for you. <laughs> wink, wink. Because a lot of people watch this. But stop living a life of change and have a plan so that when change comes, you don't have to worry because you have a plan. But without a plan, all you have is change. See, it's better to have bills instead of change. Change puts holes in your pocket. See, some of us want dollars, but all we have is change. Anywho, here's your number seven. And here's why Apostle, they can't catch it. Because the Holy Spirit makes the plan functional. The Holy Spirit makes the plan functional. This is, this is nothing but perfecting class, just so you all know. Nothing in the earth realm is functional without the Holy Spirit. Which is why... The very first prayer we pray every Sunday is the invocational prayer. He's here when we arrive. But what we're saying is, Holy Spirit, take control. We don't want to do a thing. We don't want to sing a, sing a note, pray a prayer, read a scripture, or definitely preach his word without the presence of your spirit. See, over the next several weeks, next three weeks to be specific, we're going to look at preaching the gospel. I can tell you what it is right now. I was, I am, 
and it's because. Week after that, we're going to look at what it means to build an infrastructure. The reason you're sitting in a seat right now is because of the infrastructure that was built beneath you. That's why this morning when I prayed that prayer, it wasn't even in my notes, I have to thank the Howies. I have to thank the Mamas. My wife and I can't do that without them, literally. When Pastor Howie said to me, how many years ago it was, Mike, he never called me Brother White. He was like, Mike. And I never called him Pastor Howie, by the way. I called him Howie. And he said, I said, what? He says, I'm leaving the church. I said, to do what? I'm going down to Waldorf, opening my own church. I said, did God call you to do that? He says, you're the only person that asked me that. I said, did he call you to do that? He said, yes. I said, good. Not knowing that some years later, I'll be standing in the very place he's standing. Do you know for baptism, I wear his robe? I could have gone out and bought a robe. But when mother said, how we want you to wear this robe, even though the sleeves are too short, and I don't tell nobody that, I put on that, I'm look, you know, look like I got on a short sleeve robe, that's fine. But one of my best friends in the ministry wore this robe. And I have the honor to stand in it. Some of us don't appreciate the fact that we have a biblical infrastructure in place. The fact that y'all are taking notes, you didn't learn that on your own. Our founding father taught us how to take notes. He taught us how to live. I'm going to have you preach next week. And then the week after that church, <laughs> now she's all quiet now. Which, by the way, your folded sheet didn't look too good yesterday, by the way, just so you know that. And neither did your scriptures in the Old Testament and New Testament. Anyway, the last thing we're going to learn is to reform the church. The church still needs to be reformed. Just because our founding father, Dr. John A. Cherry, is in heaven, and just because our founding father here, John Howie, is in heaven, doesn't mean the church doesn't need to be reformed. But guess what's to be reformed first? Us. I'm going to go back to what I said, church, about the fact that the Holy Spirit makes the plan functional. See, listen to this. We cannot function without the Holy Spirit. If nothing in the earth realm is functional without the spirit, that means that we, without the spirit, are not functional. Well, the only way you can be functional and have the Holy Spirit is to invite him in. Well, pastor, how do I do that? By confessing with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. Is there, is there one present today? This ain't about baptism. This isn't about the church you go to. Have you not confessed with your mouth, Jesus, and believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? If so, raise your hand. Now, Brother the Daniels didn't warn you about this. When we have members come, uh, visitors come, I look them dead in their eye. There's a brother sitting in front of you who, when he first came here, I looked at him and said the same thing. So let me ask you. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead? You have? You sure? You positive? Are you living a life like a Christian? Yeah, not so? Come up here. Come on, man. Come on. I'm not here to embarrass you. You know. We need you in the body of Christ. Yes. We need you with your off-whites on. I see you out in these streets. Yeah, I know things. We need you in these streets to help preach the gospel. And you, my friend, can preach. Whether you have a robe on or not, you can preach. You've been watching me the whole time. You have not missed one thing I've said. Not one thing. And even if you try to act like it's, you know, you've got to be cool because you want to act like you didn't miss it, it's all in your heart. Every bit of what I preached. And guess what? You know God's word. I can see it in your eyes. I believe you. You have confessed and you believe. It's just that sometimes we kind of go like this. And the path goes like this. And what God wants you to do is stay like here, not here. Fair enough? So 
although you have prayed this prayer before, I'm going to pray the same prayer. I'm going to have you repeat it after me because I want you to hear it again for the first time. Is there anyone else present who might be like my brother here who received the word at one time, gave us up to Christ at one time, but maybe going like this in our life? Anybody else before we pray? Now, you know, this might line. That's fine. They don't, have, they don't have the strength and courage like you do. So what we're going to do as I'm praying for you, we're going to pray for them as well. Fair enough? Hold on one second. Oh, there we got another brother coming on. Come on. Come on, bro. Hey, my brother. God bless you. Good to see you, man. I love what just happened. Two men in the vestibule said, no, wait a minute, Pastor. We got another one out here. I don't know how you got here. I'll find out later. Go on these streets and get these men. Stop playing. Jesus, stop playing. Anyway, we're going to pray this same prayer. So I want you to lift your hands up and repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and I believe in my heart that you, Father, raised Jesus from the dead. Today I'm saved. I'm changed to be unchangeable. I thank you, Father. I praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.